speaker, uh, Laura Quinn. She's the president of Catalyst. Um, she's a board member and uh, a president. Uh, she's the founder of the company. She served as a CEO from uh, 2006 to 2018. And Ms. Quinn previously served as the White House Deputy Chief of Staff for Vice President Al Gore as Executive Director of the U U.S. Senate uh, Democratic Technology and Communications Committee for Majority Leader Tom Daschle and in communications and economic policy positions for U.S. Senators Jay Rockefeller, Carl Levin, and Joe Biden. Uh, in addition to her work in business and government, Ms. Quinn has held senior roles on five national presidential campaigns and senior management and consulting positions for numerous national and statewide political and advocacy campaigns uh, and not-for-profits. In 2018 to 2019, she was a fellow at Harvard's, uh, Harvard's Kennedy School, uh, Ash Center for Governance and Innovation, and at Shorenstein Center for Media po uh, Politics and Public Policy. Laura will join us to expand more on the issue of disinformation problem uh, between rural and urban America. Uh, Laura, welcome to the Rural Progress uh, Summit. Thanks, JD. Um, appreciate being invited. Uh, thanks to the organizers of the conference and to everybody who's taking time out of their day to participate. So I'm going to follow up on what you were just hearing um, from Tim about, um, but I'm going to um, kind of try to present what the landscape looks like, both in terms of uh, how America is reacting to the current information environment and uh, how that information has changed environment has changed over time and, and kind of how it's operating at the moment. Um, and I'm gonna focus a lot less on content, like whose information is good, bad, or getting through. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about literally how this information ecosystem works. Because I think it's very hard to um, understand what is having impacts if you're not understanding the mechanics of how people are getting their information. So I'm gonna to try to show you some slides here. Let's see if we can get them pulled up. So are you seeing my slides okay? Yep. Okay. And uh, hopefully that's in slideshow mode at the moment. So let's start out with, I've spent um, about 40 years in this civic political government um, space. You've heard from my bio, about the first half of it, about two decades in the policy and communication space and in political campaign space. And in the last two decades, I've spent it in the data and technology space. But specifically looking at data as it relates to voters and civic behavior. So let's start with one of the questions that um, Tim brought up, which is, you know, has America changed? Are we really more polarized or not polarized? So I'm gonna show you um, a graphic here. And what you're looking at, every little bubble represents a county. So the big bubbles are the big urban counties, Miami-Dade, uh, you know, uh, Manhattan, LA, Cook County, and all the little bubbles, the smaller the bubble, that's the size of the county. So those small bubbles are the rural counties. And when you see, when I start this animation, if the bubble is moving left or right, that's what the way that that county was voting. Obviously, you know, it's moving to the, the blue side, voting for Democrat, moving to the other side, moving voting for Republicans. And if, if you see the bubbles moving up and down, that's their turnout rate. So if their turnout rate was going up, enthusiasm is going up, you see those counties going, going north and south. So let me see if I can roll this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this, how America was moving over time. So I'm gonna go all the way back to another period of time when um, you know, we started to get into some pretty serious political conflicts. So let's start with, uh, sorry about that. Let's see if I can get this to roll. So let's start with the, the Nixon landslide. And then we have Watergate. I mean, America had lots of strong opinions in these days, you know, the, the war, et cetera. But as you see, you know, America was moving more together, you know, whether it was urban or rural, as the country was making different decisions. This is Reagan's landslide. 
then Reagan's re-election, people swinging back a little bit more the other way. Um, now we're moving into Bill Clinton's first election. His second election, you always see in those midterms, the turnout goes down, but you know, and you see big urban counties on both sides of the divide, you see rural counties, but now with Gore, you're starting to see much more of a sort. And then this is the Kerry election, a lot of turnout, more and more of the sort is going on. Then you see Obama's first, now Obama's re-election, again, turnout goes down, but further polarization. And then this is what happened in the Trump election. So when you talk to social scientists about this kind of change over actually what is quite a short period of time, just a couple of, you know, a few decades, uh, uh, this is really dramatic change because now what you're looking at is America no longer sort of moving together and you're seeing a, the, the distance of, you know, from right to left is so much more spread apart. That means more and more of America is disagreeing more and more violently. And you also see this incredible sort of all of the big urban counties now, you know, thoroughly um, hearing and, and responding to the Democrats and the Democratic message. And, you know, the rural counties completely turning away from that, responding to the Republican message, and that increasing more and more over time. So something has actually happened here. And I would say that, you know, in the course of these several decades that I've just shown you, there has been serious conflict in the U.S., social conflict civil rights conflict, war, economic downturns, up economic upturns. So, you know, what we're experiencing, what we would look at as the root causes of, you know, this kind of behavior change among the electorate is not easily explained by the things that we normally look at. And, you know, in my role in the data science side, we've looked hard to try to understand and correlate people's behavior to things like uh, racial resentment, economic pressure, indebtedness, immigra immigrants moving into their community, immigrants not being in their community, um, communities that were more homogenous, communities that were less homogenous. And it is true that when we look at those factors, um, we do see some things that correlate with this kind of change and um, tearing apart of the country. Uh, if you look at what you're looking at here with these lines is, the blue line is the gap between how urban and rural folks have been voting. And you actually see that there's always been a pretty big rural, urban rural, rural gap, um, but it's been spiking more recently. And as you look, uh, I'm sorry, it, it, if you, it's, that's the red line. If you look at, there was always sort of a, you know, a gap between how urban and rural people were, were voting and probably how they were seeing the problems of the country. But when you look at their change over time since 2006, that is incredibly dramatic. As opposed to when you look at the blue line, which is the racial divide, where um, how uh, African-Americans, people of color are thinking about and, and voting, there's always been a very big divide there between white voters and um, voters of color. But that's been more consistent and pretty steady, even with some spiking here at the end. But this rural urban change is really, really um, something to look at. The other one, the green line, that correlation to change and division that exists based on education is also, um, you know, been becoming more extreme in uh, just the last um, couple of election cycles. So what's the consequence of that? So here the bubbles are congressional districts. Um, and after the last midterm election, all the way to the right are the ur most urban districts, all the way to the left are the most rural districts. And it's pretty starkly clear. You know, the, the consequence of that polarization, that consequence and that difference in the way that the voters are behaving is literally causing the, um, you know, the representation in Congress to dramatically shift into a split between, you know, urban, rural as well, um, with the Democrats doing a little bit better in the suburban spaces most recently, but the suburban spaces being the place that are still, you know, under tension and being dragged back and forth. I'm going to show you just one more of these kind of geeky, geeky data charts. Um, so sometimes people are zeroing in on the racial division, 
and they're zeroing in on the college versus non-college division. Um, some of the times we wind up hearing a lot more about the things that the data folks tend to have data about and dig into more. But that means that some of the things that they're not bothering to look at might actually be you know, more important or as important to look at. So here again, looking at the um, last midterm election, what you're looking at on the left is, this, is th this chart is only showing white voters, just white voters. But on the left, it's evangelical white voters. And on the right, it's non-evangelical white voters. And you can see here that the split between evangelical and non-evangelical is more dramatic than when we are just looking at the split between college, non-college, or the split between women and men. So how America is fracturing is really important to have in your head um, when you're starting to look at you know, what might be causing that. And so let me um, talk about uh, now the subject at hand, which is information. As I mentioned, when we started to look at what correlates with the changes that in voting behavior, we found good, you know, some correlation. There was some explanation when we looked at economic factors or, or race factors, racial tension, resentment. But when we started looking at something that, frankly, data folks have not been bothering to focus on and collect data about, which is where you're getting your information from, the correlations were really stark. So, you know, something that we haven't thought about a lot in the past, because frankly, everyone was getting their information from one, from inside one information stadium. So if you think about all civic and political activities conducted inside the media stadium. And so the shape and the way the media environment works has a profound effect not only on the electorate, but also on you know how different actors in the space formulate their strategy and, and and really have a lot to do with who's successful and who's not successful in persuading America of anything. And that information stadium that we're all operating in has changed dramatically over the course of again just a few decades. Um, so when we are now able to do what we couldn't do in the old days, which is you know, using machine learning to really examine the content uh, that is being produced by all kinds of news outlets, including digital, you know, news outlets, we can, we can actually map the nature of the content that's being, you know, pushed out by various news organizations um, and how much reach they have. And this is, you know, a fancy data uh, depiction of that. And you see, we now have a lot of news organizations that are still producing what I would call purple news that, you know, a little bit of both. Um, but we have a, a, a huge growth of, of news outlets and information sources that are giving overwhelmingly a preponderance of information that is w on one side or the other. That just didn't exist in the past. There weren't that many news outlets, and they all had pretty close to, you know, very broad reach. And they were kind of uh, crafting what they were producing to have the most appeal, frankly, so that they could hang on to the la largest audience share. But that is no longer possible. Um, you're competing with a lot more if you're in the information business. So people are tending to want to carve out a niche rather than try to broadly appeal. And that is having consequences in terms of what is now available on the shelf for people to take down and look at. And it's not so much that they now have access to things that are extreme. It's that they have access to so much that they have to start picking and choosing because Although there is now infinite shelf space for information, there is still finite amounts of attention that people you know, can um, devote in their own personal lives. And that's causing more and more people to just gravitate to one part of the shelf and be looking at one set of information um, and not getting that broader picture. So to make this point a little bit starker, we were all operating inside an information stadium that had a left, had a right, you know, Amy Goodman on one side, Rush Limbaugh on the other side, but everyone was getting a dose of, you know, some of all of it. Over the last several decades, long before, uh, you know, the advent of Facebook, that information ecosystem was ripping apart. And you were getting a more and more of, um, you know, two separate information arenas where people were getting less and less cross-pollination of what they weren't necessarily particularly interested in. 
Um, and that has been reinforced by social media and what is now available online. So what you're looking at, and I'll just show you, you know, this example, but I could show you um, examples in the other direction around what's reinforcing the old media ecosystem. The difference is, is that on the right, because I believe they felt disadvantaged by the larger um, mainstream media ecosystem for a long time, over the course of decades, there was just more work done to build specific networks that were reaching niche audiences that um, folks on the right were more most interested in, in talking to, and frankly, were not very expensive to invest in. And that include, you know, Christian broadcasting, uh, talk radio, radio became a very cheap way to uh, reach audiences and invest in. And radio has, and uh, some of these other television networks have enormous penetration, particularly inside certain communities, and particularly in rural America, where broadband and other forms of distribution are not as robust as they are in um, the urban places. So what are people are somewhat surprised when you know you show them this kind of reinforcing set of brands? These are not individual brands that are stood up by you know one actor in one place who's focused on one tiny niche audience. Increasingly, they are part of networks that are all owned by the same operators. So I'm just showing you, I just picked one out. This is the Liftable Network, which has scores and scores of media properties that are in the digital space, each tailoring to um, you know different kinds of niche audiences, but all basically getting a lot of their content produced in a central place. So that means that these new networks have as much throw weight often as, you know, some of the more traditional networks. When you looked in 2016 and 17, when, when the Liftable Network really exploded, it was already attracting more Facebook uh, followers across all of its brands than, you know, major mainstream news organizations. So the advent of these new players is really quite consequential. The fact that many of these players have a very pointed particular you know, set of information on one side or the other around some particular topic that they're driving is a new factor that just has to be taken into account when you're thinking about how and what kind of information people are getting. Um, so, uh, uh, sorry about that. So one of the things that's important to know is that these operations, they may have a political point of view, but they are also money-making enterprises. They are, for every intensive purpose, they're commercial information and entertainment networks um, that are competing for people's attention and doing it by trying to carve out a particular niche audience for themselves. And that means that they are relying heavily on social media as their new marketing platform. So they're not necessarily trying to use Facebook as a means to, in and of itself, they're using Facebook and some of the social networks as the way that they recruit viewers, followers, um, you know, folks who are willing to check in to their brands. And then they are selling that attention to advertisers. They are um, monetizing it by selling merchandise directly. It, these are commercial enterprises as well as, in some cases, um, you know, folks with political or other issue um, objectives. And this is really quite consequential as well because a larger and larger set of America is getting at least some, if not a majority of their information from do digital information providers. So even if they're still watching some television and radio, um, they are uh, increasingly, you know, part of their diet is coming from this other new information shelf space. And let's take a minute to talk about what that shelf space looks like. Behind the scenes, and this has you know, been well demonstrated by the whistleblower um, uh, revelations that have just come out in the last week. Facebook and Google and the other uh, digital platforms are not neutral in effect in that they are not simply creating more shelf space and putting you know, anyone's material on that, those shelves. And that's the end of the story. They're doing that. And they are censoring, but they're not censoring, in a sense, picking the right or the left. What, what is clearly detailed in the documents that were just released um, by the whistleblower about Facebook is that their algorithms are tuned for attention, almost unrelievingly. And what that means is if something has 
more eyeballs or not even more eyeballs. If you, if you stick with that content for a few seconds more, and I will say it's hard to wrap our brains around this idea, but they are watching billions of users do trillions of actions online. And they are measuring not at merely the milliseconds, but at the microseconds, at what you're looking at, how long you're looking, um, and what kind of response um, or comments or reaction that you're, you're having to that. And they're using that vast trove of data to reward any information purveyor who's getting you to stop and pause longer. That's it. They're not necessarily making a judgment about what's good or bad or left or right. But here's one of the things that they are optimizing for. In effect, it's our own brain weaknesses. Increasingly, people go to platforms not to tune into a particular program or even looking for a particular um, you know, flavor of information left or right. They just go there when they have a question. So by, by way of uh, giving you an example, so if you're thinking about vaccines and you're wondering whether you should get one, and perhaps you're pregnant, so you really, really are concerned, like, you know, should I be worried? I've been hearing some things. You go to a platform and it is natural, um, human, uh, normal reaction. So that if you're seeing something that's reassuring, you you tend to, you know, go by that headline and say, oh, the CDC says vaccines, vaccines are safe. Okay, I don't have to worry about that. I move on. You're scrolling past things that are reassuring and positive. But if you come across something that says, hey, vaccines cause birth defects, you know, it is only natural that you're going to stop and say, hey, wait a minute. And you're going to read that whole article. And once you've clicked on that article, the algorithms are also saying, oh, look, this person is interested in pregnancy and birth de defects around vaccines. And then it's going to start biasing that, con that consumers, that users feed to give them more and more of that uh, anxiety creating information. So this is why, especially for teenagers, it's pretty easy in the data to find that if you're a teenager who, not all teenagers, but if you're a teenager who's already a little bit worried and anxious, it's very easy to make that teenager much more worried and much more anxious and then keep driving them in a spiral down and down into that direction. So how these um, platforms work, what they're optimizing for is having consequences, not just in the United States, but across societies. Um, it is reinforcing what people are most anxious about, what people are potentially more angry about, um, and giving people a stronger and stronger diet of that set of information. So it's a, it's a different kind of censorship. It's not a censorship that's based on a political ideology, but it is certainly a, a, a set of actions that is changing the information diet of whole communities. Um, and that makes it very, very fertile ground for anyone who wants to exploit that space. You know, for people who now understand how to manipulate the algorithms, they understand that it's a great place to take any particular anxiety, fear, um, or, you know, negative attitude and amp it up. And to counter that with positive is very hard. You almost have to do, you know, some order of magnitude more of positive information like vaccines are safe to break through at an equal level because the platform algorithms are biased towards the anxiety making. And this means that it stokes what might be a low level of anxiety about any issue into something that can turn into, you know, a violent rage. And we've seen the worst of this kinds of effects in other parts of the world, frankly. And, you know, what's happening, uh, obviously, you've heard about what happened with the Rohingya uh, in uh, Myanmar, but, you know, we're seeing this kind of effects in Nigeria and in, in um, Tigray and, and other parts of the world as well. And it's also the kind of thing that is fertile ground for just driving conspiracy, for making people believe that something that they think they kind of had a suspicion about was actually really true. Because, again, you're much more likely to pause and 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 uh, take just a little bit more time with something that is a little bit um, uh, reinforcing of a conspiracy than than any kind of content that's saying don't worry everything's okay. So you know how do we do something about this? I mean it's pretty tough right now. The platforms, this particular recipe of especially for Facebook of going after your attention and and allowing people to monetize your attention. I mean, frankly, that's the way television has worked for a long time. But the folks at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, has put that recipe on absolute steroids, and it is an enormous profit-making enterprise for them. 
you know, we're talking about a company that only, you know, a uh, little more than a decade ago uh, or a couple of decades ago was not making any money. And now uh, this chart is old. They've already crossed the $40 billion a year net profit line. So you're talking about a recipe that is phenomenally profitable. So getting them to uh, change some of their product design that would possibly cost them a little bit of money is no easy feat in and of itself. Um, and, you know, there are other, you know, networks of actors that are using this kind of uh, operation to build bigger and bigger, frankly, commercial media operations that are capitalizing on this kind of recipe being um, very um, powerful. So let me say a word before I, you know, lay all the blame on the uh, doorstep of the uh, the social media platforms in the digital space. It is important to recognize that in certain parts of the country, and, and among certain uh, older folks, they're still digesting a big diet of television and radio, along with more and more of the digital um, side of things. So the older you are, basically think forty five and above you're still taking in a lot of television and radio. And the older you are, the more you're taking in. As you move lower than 45 years old, you know, the youngest uh, folks are taking in less and less. They're, they're even moving away from Facebook and now they're all in Instagram and TikTok. So in the short run, um, meaning the next several election cycles, next several decades, the focus on legacy media uh, needs to be, you know, continues to be strong. Um, particularly in places where legacy media is not competing with as much digital information. And that especially is in rural America, where broadband is you know, less available. Uh, radio is still incredibly powerful. People spend a lot of time in their cars. And you know, some of the local, locally controlled uh, local station groups have um, you know, more trust and are more powerful and persuasive than um, national networks that are, you know, increasingly, um, the, the national network's audience is increasingly urban and um, suburban. So one last thing before I turn it over to the next speaker, a couple of things to think about when you're thinking about this new information arena, right? So the old world and the new world have some things in common. They're both, you know, systems that reach largely everyone the at this point in the us at least the old legacy system still has a little bit more reach in certain rural parts of the country but you know it's not long before the digital side captures more and more especially as what you can get in your handheld device becomes more and more equivalent to, than what you can get um, through broadcast devices the second thing they both paid for by selling attention you are only able to sell attention one way in the old broadcast system, and that was by selling ads. You can sell attention many more ways in the new uh, system. You know, if you are able to, uh, you know, sell people attention for merchandising and commerce, that's as lucrative or more lucrative even, or getting folks to subscribe or become donors, you know, more like the public television uh, recipe of old. But the other thing in the political information space that's really consequential is in the old world, it was so expensive and there was so such a small amount of shelf space that really only two narratives were generally presented at scale. Because and, and ad dollars, if you had enough ad dollars, you could buy your way in front of any audience you want. You may have thought, you know, older people didn't want to hear your message, but you could put your message, you know, in advertising on Golden Girls or Jeopardy, and you would be sure that you were getting your message through to them. And in the old system, um, if veracity wasn't rewarded, there were penalties that could be leveled on folks who really were, you know, uh, extremely, um, you know, mendacious. In the new world, shelf space galore, many competing narratives. No matter how much money you have, you you don't get to buy your way in front of an audience. You've got to get them to choose you. And disinformation, as I was mentioning, is actually uh, strongly rewarded. And, and it's not just disinformation, I would say. It's sort of negative uh, information. And that is why more and more in this digital space, you have folks that are looking not to rent advertising slots next to programming. They're, in effect, building operations to own the programming itself. 
And you see the consequences of this in the political space where when in the old days, if you had more advertising money than your opponent, you would, you know, have a you would have a big advantage and you would likely win the day. We are regularly seeing now that even candidates who outspend their opponents are not necessarily coming up with the results that they, you know, got used to ex- ex- um, um, uh, to expecting. Um, so more and more, as I said, we have, you know, folks who really understand the mechanics of this space, exploiting it more effectively than those who are still clinging to an understanding of the old media system. And that includes, you know, political actors, but also, uh, you know, uh, uh, folks like the Russians, the Chinese, other malign actors who have other kinds of agendas that are anti-democratic and certainly not um, good for America. Uh, And, you know, that idea of polarism Uh, I think needs to also be examined. There's many ways to think about it, but understanding it and and the way that it is becoming worse as perhaps um, partly a function of the nature, shape, and the mechanics of the media environment uh, is a very, very important uh, new set of information, new set of factors that people need to take more account of as they're thinking about all kinds of civic, political, social problems, and and how to... uh, and how to make our democracy more um, functioning. And I think I'll stop there. Hope I didn't go over time. Not at all, that was amazing. Uh, You're gonna be around for a few questions with the panel, is that right, Laura? Uh, Yes, I think I um, For a little bit at least? Okay, good, because I know we have a couple questions. Well, since I have you right here, let's let's start this off um, uh, before I introduce the, the panel. Um, there was a, a question uh, about, do you favor federal legislation uh, uh, when it comes to Facebook and, and in what form? Well, there's, you know, uh, there's a number of different problems that the social media platforms are presenting to society. I guess they fall into three categories. One is there's actual criminal activity that's happening on the platforms, like just flat out, that isn't legal anywhere else in any other media environment, you know, everything from selling babies and endangered species parts and, you know, all kinds, you know, people looking for opioid treatments gets getting turned over to opioid dealers, people promoting, uh, you know, uh, human smuggling at the borders. Certainly, you know, a set of standards can be put in place to at least dry up the worst of the worst. That's one. The second one is this, this problem of the design itself. You know, there's there's many things that you can measure that the platforms are doing. If they're if you're just measuring attention, you're going to get what we have now. But there are other ways of measuring. Are you creating more, you know, teen anxiety? And perhaps by forcing a little bit more of a um, uh, a broader set of of metrics that they should be measured by, would um, simply forcing that to happen and exposing that would perhaps cause the, the, the platforms themselves to reconsider some of their own algorithmic design. Because I, I think even they don't want a destabilized world where we're all tearing each other apart. And then the last piece is um, sort of a really difficult one because part of the problem here is these companies have become so large that they don't really have to listen to anybody's advice, suggestions, or even potentially regulations, pretty soon. Users, advertisers, um, you know, uh, their own shareholders, I mean, it's it's reaching a point where they can bully pretty much everyone. And I think that's also, including co- competitors who might come up with a, a different, more appealing recipe than the one they have. And I think that there's some um, reason to think that, you know, there are some curbs that need to be put in place. I wouldn't want to even begin to say I'm an expert on what any of the three categories of actual policy making should be, but there are surely three problem problem sets that should be attacked, I think. And yeah, um, it, it, what we're seeing too, uh, that what you mentioned about, like they're getting so big, I mean, almost too big for any one country and, and their influence on a lot of things, yeah. Um, and we've always counted in this country that if anything got too big, you know, the competition would keep them from getting completely out of control. At this point, they're so able to crush their competition. You know, you've got a competition policy issue that I think deserves some real attention. Right. 
Uh, and this kind of leads into this next question, and then we'll open up to the panel. So panel folks, be ready. Um, what role do you uh, think local news channels play in this political climate in rural areas, especially with conservative corporations like Sinclair Broadcasting buying or affiliating with local news stations and implementing uh, must runs, uh, et cetera? And is the impact of small uh, uh, comparison to the Facebook bubbles and social media phenomenon? Yeah, two quick questions, uh, two quick answers to that. Um, if you believe that good information is, a, is is part of what democracies need to function well, you got to invest in it, right? And believing that you can um, ensure enough good information gets through just with occasional advertising campaigns, I think is a mistake. But, you know, trading one group of far removed owners who really don't understand a community very well with a different set of <laughs> far removed owners who don't understand that community well, probably might not solve the problem either. So investment that has roots in some local ownership, local management, hiring local news gathering um, capabilities, and even producing programming, you know, covering local events, it used to be really, really, really expensive to produce content. It's right. actually not that expensive anymore. But we haven't built now the capacities to uh, create more content that's of a positive you know, nature and then take what the steps necessary to ensure that that stays as close to the community that it's talking to as you can possibly get it. Um, you know, even if there's some outside investors that you've got some good, deep local ownership roots, that's the best way to protect everything from turning into, you know, one giant propaganda machine that's in the hands of any particular set of actors. That's great. Um, well, thank you, Laura. Uh